Good morning, everyone. My name is Ling, and uh, it's the first time I'm standing here before you today. Um, long story short, before we start, let's um, hang out this Saturday morning. Everybody, um, send, you know, wake up every very early today if you know this weekend morning. And uh, it's going to be a very technical topic. So I want it to be as straightforward, as simple, and as easy as possible. Okay. So um, make yourself feel comfortable. Like, so raise your hand if you need to ask any questions. And um, yeah, don't feel so trapped about it because it's a technical um, issue and topic. And you can always catch up with me later. Uh, right. First, start about me. This is me. Yeah, my name is Ling. I've been here. <laughs> Which is, yeah, sorry, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. So, I mean, in uh, Sunday morning, this appears to start off. Hope you don't feel <laughs> too uncomfortable with that because I am very comfortable with myself. Um, I have <laughs> um, around two years' experience with DataBot now and uh, with BBB Boat, which is the package in BBB that helps you to work with DataBot. And also my third project in using data code, uh, I focus on e-commerce and uh, the scale is around 1,500 1, models with um, 1,500 text. And can you see what it is right now? Okay. And uh, my worst nightmare is data code and my second worst nightmare is fixing the stuff with data code, which is testing them. So today I will introduce you about data code. Before to do that, uh, let's get to know each other a little bit. Right. So the first topic is that please raise your hand if you actually have experience with data modeling. Data modeling, data modeling, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, around 11 people. Oh, oh people with data modeling. All right, that's good. So after the good start, second one, how many, how many of you actually work on dimensional modeling? Dimensional modeling, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13. All right, good one. Data vote. One? Zero. All right, then you, you, can, you can come up here. <laughs> All right, good one. All right, oh, this is easy. Uh, if you um, yellow pack, raise your hand. Yellow pack, yellow pack, yellow pack, yellow pack, raise your hand. Yellow pack, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So then only 12 yellow tags. All right, green tag. Green tag. 12 yellow tags. No, around 10. No, 8. Green tag. Red tag. Ooh, expert. All right, don't ask me questions. <laughs> okay, good one. Um, so it's good that everybody have a baseline for this um presentation is there are any any terms or any stuff during the presentation that you don't know i'll try to explain it to you if that taking too much time you can always see me after right and this is an overview of my speech today will take you about one hour trying to sleep um the first topic will be the overview of the world and relevant concept so um review it a little bit the second one would be uh where they will stand in our modern data architecture Third, we will go through the double components. Um, be reminded that we only do, you know, a simple, basic set of components today, even though the is pretty really com comprehensive. There's a lot of, you know, extra components in there, but I think that today for 101, we only go through the simple, the basic one. Okay. Um, the next one will be the double pros and cons. And the third one, um, at the next one after that, uh, I think that everybody gonna ask the question, but I just put it here anyway. Is that a complete comparison between traditional dimensional modeling and data code? And finally, is um, how to just roughly we're not gonna do um, we're not gonna do a live demo today, but roughly show you how to build the data code project using the BTP package. Final Q and A. Okay, cool, cool. Refresh, refresh. All right, good. And the beer is good. Okay, data code overview. So um, before we go into data vault as the modeling technique itself, let's just talk about data vault as the concept. But, um, it's a little bit bigger than just modeling. Right? Data vault, the latest version of data vault right now is data vault 2.0. It was um, created by Dan Lindstedt. I hope I got his name right. And um, it's a, a system of intelligence that aims to provide data for enterprise. 
uh, and uh, data warehousing and information delivery. So enterprise are very um, big words, which actually is a very important concept that we're gonna go through later. Um, in short, is um, only apply where we have a very big system, very complex with multiple software. We'll go through that detail later. This is the side. There are two, three pillars of um, data vault uh, as a concept. There were 2.0, that um, methodology, architecture, and model. All of them, you just need to remember the key thing is that it is agile, it is scalable, susceptible to change, and it's easy to, you know, this means it's easy to add things in, it can modify things without breaking the current structure. The second one is that because it's aimed for uh, simple, repeatable, measurable as methodology, it is very um, compatible with tools like DBT, where you can actually use automation based in base or in micro. If you're familiar with DBT, and you can be loaded data in at very high speed. And um, for architecture and model, same, same thing as the goal, but there's one important thing to remember that everything is hash based. So it's support no SQL. So we can go a little bit into that later. Okay. Uh, this is the, from um, the book called Primer for all the data scientists from Inman and Dan Minster. If you are familiar with uh, dimensional modeling or her normal form, you already know in one, right? Anybody doesn't know this guy. <laughs> yeah, I just know his name like yesterday when I just Google it. But, um, but basically, um, <laughs> there's uh, the most famous and the most common um, data modeling technique right now, probably dimensional modeling, right? And after that, it be a little bit more on the um, enterprise model of data modeling, that is the human, um, human concept. So it's um, basically just the normal form. Um, to put it simple, simply, for well, anybody to get everybody on the same page, dimensional modeling, we aim from, uh, we go from bottom to top. So we try to get data as fast as possible to do analytics, right? We don't actually care about how we load data in, in structural way, how we store, how we do history management, how we audit. it. Don't really actually care about that. The way we, we try to roll out as fast as possible, start schema, so, and very wide, the normal life table. So people can come in, check data, like, all right, I can get um, information from this, even though I'm really not good at data warehousing. On the contrary, in month, we started with um, top to bottom. We started with business and enterprise requirement first. We try to model those data from the enterprise level down to the bottom. And then analytics uh, people will try to build another layer to be data mark upon them to actually get the data that they want. But um, in one concept, well, of course, it's because it's so top down, it's not really analytical friendly, I guess. So it's pretty hard for the analyst people to actually work with those kind of so national modeling, uh, with those kind of three normal form modeling. So that's why this guy, this that he think about something in the middle, which is played about. So he combined both um, both normal forms and dimensional modeling. We still have a little bit um, hiccups in between. We will talk about that. So, and that's the, the concept. It's three things I didn't remember about it. Both is that it's very detail oriented. Care about a lot of stuff that actually analysts doesn't care about. But we as a data warehouse architect, I think we care about that. And it's his has his like called tracking. So we know when, how, when each role data was loaded into the system, by who. So we can blame them. Yeah. And it is unique, it's a unique link set on normalized label. Normalized label, so not be normalized, not wide label, very small, very straightforward, one row, only one um, you know, unique records, stuff like that. If you want to go a little bit more into it with them, uh, we can talk about normalized and denormalized. Label. Okay, so uh, let's go to a quick review of relevant concept. Okay, talking too much. Okay. First of all, hard rule and soft rules. Hard rules, simple, doesn't, doesn't change on the angle brain. So um, you can do data type alignment, uh, casting numbers to the ENT, to string, stuff like that. 
and you do normalization. So breaking wide table into smaller table with the unique set of records and no dependency. Um, you do the duplication or restructure. Strictly no aggregation, no group by, no changing the content of data itself, no um, uh, page one stuff like that, no any new columns. But that's hard rule. Second is soft rule. Soft rule is, yeah, you guess it, chain data or green. So you do um, aggregation, you do uh, metric calculation, and rename, concast, compute, whatever that is, and actually change the content of the column or the row itself. Okay, pretty straightforward. Next one is keys. Um, these three type of keys are the ones that we want to see a lot in playable modeling. The first one is natural key. Straightforward, the name that you know for yourself. Natural key is a key that coming from your source data. No modification, no um, changing stuff. For example, in the table down below, natural key will be the employee name. And straightforward from raw data, not changing anything. Second one is surrogate key. You are involved with um, um, modeling or um, dimensional modeling before. You might be pretty familiar with this uh, type of key. So basically, it's um, artificially generated keys, GUID, if you already work with that for customer. And this key is actually to identify one unique role in the whole table set. It doesn't necessarily need to have any meaning. For the visit user, but it doesn't have to be have any close relation to the natural key. The, the only um, purpose of the survey key is to identify one unique world. You can see the survey key on, on the left side. You cannot deduct anything from those numbers, right? But if I on, on the search for the um, <laughs> that specific row with that specific survey key, I know it's only one row in the table. And the last one is uh, a, little, a little bit of slippery slope, it's a business key. It's, um, it's a key that is used by business. It might be natural key, it might be not. But sometimes business want to define something that is only in the business logic. It doesn't make sense for us as a data warehouse technician. Right? For example, the business key right here is BOS 00102, something like that. It is not an actual employee name. But, um, in this case, you can guess, maybe. Uh, in this case, it's actually the team name, BOS is team name, P is team name, and the number after that is, a, is an ID for this guy, John Smith, in that team. So that this key is kind of like a combination, but it's only work for business. We don't know, we don't derive anything. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a key. Keys. <laughs> the last kind of keys, which is the hardest one, is has to be and has to. Uh, anybody doesn't know what Haskey is? Thank you. Okay, good one. <laughs> this is very hard to actually explain, so I just want to see how many people want to challenge me. I'm not going to answer that question. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'll, I'll do that like that. Uh, for now, um, you're familiar with uh, Bitcoin or NoSQL database. Hashing is a very common stuff in there. Hashing is basically an algorithm that turns error all of the inputs, usually um, number of strings, but like that, you know, work. Turn out with um, such a hash string that the fixed length means unique for that combination of keys. Um, so it's a one way street, right? So any combination of keys going into a hash string algorithm always will produce the same hash. It, that's actually the same um, type of data. Um, has been using uh, been used a lot in um, NoSQL data uh, in um, uh, stuff that you need to uh, how to explain that you need to make sure that the whole row is unique, but you only have a small space for key. For example, you can see the hash tape of this row, the right side of the uh, table down there. You see those those numbers. The four uh, four rows of number they are actually unique, but they represent the whole um, the whole row. So it's kind of like the um, unity of the whole with the whole row. But this just hash put this one column, two column, three column, four column, put in a bunch of hash um, algorithm and put out a short string that represents the whole column. A hash key because they are fixed length. 
and they are universal. They can work with uh, structural and non-structural data. And so it allows us to do a lot of mass, massive parallel processing. We don't need to actually look up the keys from, sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. You can actually to look up the keys um, when you load data into our warehouse, but uh, you just need to do the hash. Right? And you don't need to actually wait for the, for the table to, to you know, finish loading the key. You can have everything in, in the raw data and you can do all, all, all of them parallelly. Um, the final concept is hash diff. And um, hash diff is a little bit different. So um, hash diff, usually they hash the attribute column that associate with the primary keys. So for example, I have uh, activity to the slow changing dimension type two. And I want to know if that primary key attribute changing over time. I will put all the uh, attribute columns into a hashing algorithm, have a hash diff, and we compare that over time to see how it changed. To make sure that a new data coming in is not duplicated or something like that. Okay, cool. So that's hash key and hash diff. Okay, keep on. So on to the important question, where is data ball standing in our modern data architecture? So this is a um, generic data platform. Uh, let's go over it um, very slowly, all right? So the left side is a source data system, the raw data, the people just feeding in your data. It can be OLTP, API, stream manual, some guy just do um, uh, random calculation on Excel sheet or something like that. So sort this source system, the um, team columns on You can, the, the most two popular type right now are batch injection and real time injections. Just talk about batch injection first, right? The batch injection usually goes into a big block or data lake. You have a landing where raw data, you have quality layer, you check if there's application or not, if it is meet our, our criteria or not before we're loading in. And maybe we have EII. Well, so if you already work with um, company, in uh, America, Europe, or, you know, um, where people actually care about masking data, and you, you probably have to go through the PII process. It is, um, sorry, what is this? What, what PI stand for again in that? Can you help me that? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It's not, uh, no, that, that's a, uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, that, that, that personal identification, for example, if my name goes into a database, I don't want that. Uh, developer guy to see my name or email or, or, or um, phone numbers in there. So we need to mask them. So the developer only see you know, a hash string or maybe a star, 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 dot gmail, stuff like that. Okay, so hashing. So PI yeah, layer. And then we go, and we go into warehouse layer. Yeah. So we just keep the agile mapping as it's for ML uh, developer who actually want to do stuff in the leg and uh, probably will not touch up the leg. So data warehouse, um, if we are gonna put data vault into the whole system, data vault is more about loading and storing data uh, systematically. It is not actually very good for analytic layers. So it should just be for dimensional modeling. Okay. If we put it, put it in the app that's why they have the PAI, we go into raw data vault. Data vault will split into two steps actually. The first one is raw data book. We try to keep it as raw as possible. We already do some stuff before that, so maybe, maybe it's medium rare, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it goes into raw data book, medium rare. And um, after we store all of them in the book structure, there are some business rules we need to apply before we actually have them in the booking layer. Right? So that's the, that's the business book problem. And finally, information mark and stuff like that. Anything, anything, whatever. You can see a small screen, whatever, and there into a report layer. <laughs> so there were the hard rule and, and soft rule. Then you get where the hard rule and soft rule is. That's probably easy. So uh, I'll just answer the question. Hard rules, hard rules, soft rules. Sorry, hard rule, hard rules, raw, 
um, raw data data book is, is our rule, and this is rule is soft rules. Okay. So no changing the content of data until using the data book. Okay, okay, good. Okay, that's it. Let's go into um, data book component. We only need to use, use three main basic and the most important components to data book today. There are more to them. We can talk about that later. The first one would be um, hubs. So hubs is kind of like um, a dimension model. It's only one movable one file key. So basically, it's a new, it, it's a table that store all visitors in the source system. It's a central entity of the whole readable system. All right, all keys go into hubs, and a single hub to create a central repo for each type using an object. So, um, for example, you work in 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 retails, and you have um, people who actually place the order, right? So it's the order ID, and uh, people who actually make a payment. Each payment will have each ID, and the payment ID will be in a separate hub, and the order ID will be in a separate hub because that's a different business object. Now, if there are two types of payments, somebody pay by card, somebody pay by um, Momo, somebody pay by transfer, there will be a different type of payment, right? But probably they will have the same payment ID if you put into it. So, if possible, they should be in the same hub because the same um, business object. It, it structural, it unique, and stable. It minimal dependency. So. Um, the way that I will build is that they try to get everything get to load in parallelly at the same time, and it does not depend on other. So it try to be minimal dependency. You see that it's a basic hub customer. So for example, if I have a customer ID of people new customer coming into my store, I have his ID I will store him into a hub. This is how it should look like. The first one is um customer hash key. So we already hash the um ID before coming into a hub. The second one is actual natural key. So we can see that a little bit easier when we're doing work with the hub. And, and the last one is the metadata. This is one of the most important stuff about our data board. We need to know when it will load it into our, our data board and re record source. So where it's coming from. Back to the um, example of our dependent ID late, uh, earlier, you might have different raw data. If you they pay by card, there will be a raw card, visa, debit, um, visa, um, uh, UOB, MasterCard, raw data, right? So that, that's a different record store. And one they pay by cash, that's a different um, record store. Or okay, the more more, a different record store. Right? So we need to know when, how, where each ID was loaded to the hub. And the most important thing about um, all the data, all the entity in the report is that they are insert only. So we will try not to modify any role that's already in, in the in the data book of itself. But if that's a new key, they check it. If they if that key doesn't exist yet in the hub, they will try to load it in at that time. But if there's a new key that already exists, they will just um, remove it from the loading process. They will not try to change the content of the hub, right? It's not only. Okay, the next one, links. So if you are already familiar with dimensional modeling, the fact table, we try to denormalize the table, to add many, as many columns in one row as possible. So the user can come and see, all right, this is like to this, that way to that. But um, in the table, we do the reverse process. So we normalize the table and make it as unique and simple as we can. So in order to model the relationship itself, we have links. So basically links connect up compared to other wider table. It, <coughs> instead of adding foreign key to the table, we make them into a separate table that represent the relationship between these keys. It is flexible to change and easy to model if you actually work with complex relationship. Uh, imagine you have a um, very wide table on transaction. You have the uh, relationship between your customer, your order ID, your payment type, your product ID and maybe the date that they actually make the transaction. You have a lot of links in there. You have a lot of um, relationship between keys in there. Right? Um, in the book, we try to break it down, each keys, each relationship into a single link model. It should look like this. 
For example, this is link. Key one, key two is a link order customer. Here's the relationship between order and customer. Basically, which customer made which order, which order ID belongs to which customer. And if we see that on top, of course, they have a primary key, unique key. So it's a hash key between order ID and order ID and customer ID. The next one is the order ID hash key. Again, okay, hashing, yes. And a customer hash key that goes with that order. The natural key, order ID, customer ID. And of course, I got that, no data, second source, as before. This is actually a modified version of Rare because um, in the level, we want to minimize the load of natural key, only you have to be so unique, um, it's um, coherent around the system. So um, usually links in the level doesn't have natural key, but for um, your new impressor and for debugging uh, step, they put natural key in there for easier, you know, to see what is, what is going on easier. Uh, last bit about NTPs today, I want to introduce you is Sacroline. So, basically, it's the script data with history. So, it's storing contextual, descriptive, and historical info about hubs and links, depending on whether data related to using object or relationship. So, Sacroline is kind of like the addition to hubs and links. So, there are Sacroline that provide more info for hub. There are Sacroline that provide more info for links. But they all do the same thing that they have extra attributes and they're scoring history and how those attributes change over time. For example, this is SAT customer. So it's a satellite that contributes to hub customer that we just talked about before. If we look at this, that we only see customer ID, right? We don't know what his name is, we don't know all the attributes like email, and stuff like that. Satellite will be the one that provides more info to, to that primary key with that uh, customer ID. So we have maybe have first name, last name, maybe have email or address. And the most important thing is, is that it has the hash width column. So it hash first name, last name. So this guy, uh, this guy, girl, um, this person, if they marry into another family and they change that first name, last name, there will be another role with different load data. And with, with the same person ID, but different first name and last name. And of course, a different uh, person cached it. So we will store that history. We will know that when that guy changed his last name and when that role, they like that loaded into the system. Cool, cool. Okay. Hey. Hey. If you put them all together, um, it's kind of like Lego blocks. Um, because every single one of them is, a, is uh, non dependent on each other. If there's a new data type coming in, there's a new uh, business object coming in, we can always model them under this, most of the time, yes, uh, under these three types of data uh, entities. And if there's a new stuff coming in, we just add them in into like label box, right? If you look at here, for example, if we have um, Right, or we all we talk about uh, customer payment and product, right? Well, customer order payment and product, and maybe we want to add in um, what is that promotion program, right? Promotion program, we have another hub promotion, which is the right one, uh, which is the the, the <laughs> photo blind, sorry, the blue one, and a satellite to add more information about that promotion. And historical change of that promotion, and then the links to uh, the order, right? because the promotion has to go with the order. We cannot actually give the promotion to um, unless it's a lifetime promotion for the customer. Right? If there's a lifetime promotion for customer, there should be a link to promotion from promotion to customer. If it's just the order um, promotion, then only the link from the order to promotion. Okay. Right? So basically, it's level long. They put new stuff in. Maybe both that out. It's because of that. So Databook is pretty agile in the way that we manage multiple data sources. Um, we can change it and add new things with ease without having to, you know, uh, compared to we don't we, we don't have a structural system to load data in. We load data directly into uh, stuff like dimensional modeling. We need to revise that model a lot, especially the fact that we need to 
break it down or full refresh the whole thing. So this is how this looks like. This is what uh, me and my mate that doing every day. So uh, we need to draw DRE. And this is a very simple DRE of the hub that we just talked about. So um, of the, the data board we just talked about, customer payment order. Imagine this, this is a process. The customer walking to my store, he has the customer ID, he placed an order to buy an uh, ID, right? And he paid five cards. The customer walk in, the hub customer will add that customer ID if he has been working in the store before. Add the customer ID into the hub customer. Uh, he made an order. The order ID will be in the hub order. He actually paid, right? <laughs> and the hub payment, it will go in, in um, the payment ID will be go, will go into the hub payment. Any um, extra info about any of those key will go in the satellite. For example, satellite customer, you have a customer hash key that match with the customer hash key in here. Usually, because satellite are um, the kind of model that do historical keeping. So this is one to many relationship. There might be many, many roles with this customer hash key in here. Um, same with payment, one to many relationship. We have the payment hash key, and the hash key in here. They have order ID, payment method, amount, payment hash key, stuff like that in the satellite. Same with help other. And finally, the link, that link all of them together, which customer doing, uh, making what order and uh, which order link to what payment. A little bit about adding new promotion hubs in. Okay? So it's kind of the same thing. So another hub promotion, a link from hub promotion to hub order, a satellite hub promotion. You can think of any any other scenario just adding in as a little block. Okay. Okay. Finally, I think that I, I already mentioned it at the um in the talk, but uh, it's good to, to, to really remind you again a little bit about this. Is that the single most important thing about modeling data code is that we try to model the business process rather than the data. So um good example is that um in my project I used to model um Again, as a payment um, example, I use the model a separate hub for Visa, separate hub for MasterCard. You know, like a lot of new uh, stuff in there that doesn't actually represent a business object. So it just makes things a little bit more complicated. So if we model it as a business process, then it will be way easier down the line for the person who actually do data analytics. I will view the final layers up on the level layers to actually get the inside out. Oh, this time from my, my work mate, so he's not here. So you can send me there as well. Okay. A lot about Edible already. Let's talk about crossing funds. Good thing about Edible, it is very good for multiple source integrations. It's agile, it's scalable, it's animal faster loading because of hash keys. It's very easy to automate because everything is structured, simple, independent. Maybe you use, use DVD, just one click, and maybe it's already good everything for you. Um, it's about real time data streams. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this is actually pretty vague and it's arguable. Uh, to me, uh, because of um, hash keys and because of the massive prior loading, um, data board, loading a stream of data into data board is a little bit easier easier than com compared to if you do stream data into dimensional model. Right? You can load everything in at the same time without waiting for, uh, you know, maybe for dimension to load or back to load. And also because you're using hash key and it can also work and loading data from node C4 database and so on. Um, well, again, it's very debatable. I know that a lot of you have been doing dimensional modeling and some of my friends already then streaming directly to dimensional modeling and it even work better than my data board model right now. So uh, this is arguable. So I just put it there for you to you know have something to compare. What is bad about data board? New layers are to be developed, many table, many joins, many table, many join, many table, many join. It's very important you need to repeat it three times, right? There are many, many table, many, many joins that you need to deal with in data board. 
This structural is easy to understand, it's straightforward, it's label block, agile, but you need to deal with a lot of labels and products. In fact, if you you want um if you want a straightforward one way raw data analytic layers, let's not do it. It takes you a lot of time to build it up, even though that it gives you a good um historical tracking auditability, but a lot of maintenance overhead. Okay. The next one is extra data processing, more data processing, more loading, more processes it means more money. We do anything on cloud right now. And finally, it can be difficult, difficult for direct queries for reporting. Again, data vault is not actually good for reporting layer. And usually, we need to do some more transformation or another layer on top of it to actually work with reporting. When do you use data vault? When you have multiple sources, integration required. When you have the enterprise data warehouse requirement, you, have, you need agility in your process there's new source coming in every day there's new requirement coming in every day you need traceability and auditability if you're working in the price there will be another you know audit team coming in and check when it's coming in what is it finance number correct you need traceability and auditability in your data warehouse to actually tell them that it is correct i'm not lying to you right and finally scalability and then with agile same thing and when not irritable, you don't need any integration. You work with um, 100 Excel sheet. No, you don't need to. Right? Um, existing with that warehouse, there is no issue or the system is not changing. So the system has been there for like 10 years. It's not going to change in the couple five, five more years, which is highly arguable. But um, well, you can take a government application, for example, it doesn't change over the years. You need to actually introduce more friction into the system. No enterprise data warehouse requirement. Yeah, no, you don't need masking. No, no, you need, um, oh, sorry, masking is on the, on, 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 on. no, um, you don't need to talk down modeling for the whole thing. Then, no, for example, it's just one sales report, isolated reporting requirement, one raw to, um, one raw table to one report. No, and a very small system. All right. Okay, comparing dimensional uh, and variable modeling. Usually, I will not do this. I recommend you not get real comparison like this because they are built for different things. But still, they are a little bit overlapping between. So here's the comparison. Um, faster data retrieval, of course, dimensional modeling. Right, reporting it's easier, fewer join dimensional modeling, code complexity. Data mode is really, really easy actually. Um, even though we have a lot of joins, but all of them are repeatable and independent. Uh, auditability is repeating, of course, data phone, lineage, key looks up time, or hash key, keys over time, and we a separate hub for each key, so key look time be faster, parallel loading time, data go. Flexibility in adding and modifying sources between rules, of course, data code, incremental development, also data code. Yeah. You, you can add new things like your block, right? And possibility to possibility to automate um, with tools like DDP right now, and this probably goes both sides. Right? And time to market, mm, probably dimensional modeling, like straightforward, net model to model. And skill availability. Um, they don't want screen, and I think in Vietnam, not really in uh, in already, you know, uh, data developed country, but um, they don't want to screen new in Vietnam. And I think right now, the small to medium business they need um, fast delivery, so they need raw data inside almost immediately. So, data vault is not actually very popular right now. So, the skills on the market, mm, probably dimensional model, and uh, that's a notes in there about um history keeping so um a lot of my friends already argue with me that dimensional modeling can actually do history keeping uh, with scd2 uh, it's not that hard to do so yeah i'll give them that history keeping is actually a technique uh data both is have this built into the, to the system itself so for all the type of modeling you will need to do some scd2 modification that's fine so one of the good practices for enterprise data warehouse is to use the hybrid technique 
I have to shoot, so you mean for data code um, from data lake going to raw code, uh, going to business code, and we do dimensional modeling for information mark on top of data code instead of using data code directly for uh, reporting. Okay, uh, this won't be fast because um, I assume that everybody, or it's about something, I assume everybody already familiar with DBT, so this will be fast. So, um, DBT package, if you're already familiar with DBT, you must know DBT package because it's, it's just like um, community developed codes that um, we can use them into our system when you actually do DBT. And there's a community developed uh, package, it's called Automate Data Vault, um, formerly called DBT Vault, that helps you to build a whole data system in probably a few of things. Yeah. There's a documentation um, available there. They have a very detailed um, example on how you can load data and how you can use um, this package already. So I can just walk you through a very simple process. Okay. So the first one, the most important one is hashing or in the or in the package is called a staging macro. Yeah, um, familiar with loading process, we already have we always have the, the landing place or the staging place. You prepare your data before you load it in the end, right? In the staging macro will hash your data. You need to define define your hash key. You think there is a customer hash key, and you find your hash list, which column is actually getting hashed, so excluding right. primary key, right? So you can check the change um, of that primary key over time. Uh, then set them all into um, uh, variables and put them all into the both uh, stage macro. I'll do the rest for you. Yeah, has this here? We have two important things has key, has this here. Okay. The next one is a hub macro. Uh, if you can guess it, there's a hub macro, there's a link macro, and there's a satellite macro. Right. So, hub macro, same thing. Um, you need to identify the, the hash key before the stage. We only have the stage part where you have the customer key in here, right? And then the hub macro you just need to load them in. Everything will be in one single macro. What they did behind the scene is they check if that hash key is already exists in the hub. If it doesn't exist, you want to add it in. If it already exists, they will just keep the loading process. Also, it will mark you the load date time and record source where it's coming from and when to load it. Link macro. Remember the little bit trickier because um, uh, you need to have two. Keys, right? You, you try to modify, sorry, you try to model relationship. So you need to have two keys. So and you have two natural key of order and customer in here for link order customer. And a hash key, the hash key is order customer key, hash key, which is represent a unique role. You need to combine them for this, but typically it's already have a macro for that. Uh, and you need to actually do it manually. And of course, metadata, metadata load data type, record source. Um, yeah, again, the um, DVD vote package doesn't actually have uh, natural keys for link. They only have hash key, but it's pretty hard to actually look at hash key and, and defer what is going on in that. So we modify it a little bit to, it's an extended version. We modify it a little bit to add natural key into the, the macro. And finally, Satellite macro. Satellite macro, you need to have hash key. You need to check change. What it did, what, what it does behind the scene is that uh, have a hash key, which is primary key, and then a hash key. It compare uh, the um, hash with the latest status of uh, the previous history for data. If that, that hash is not the same as the latest status, it will not load it in. If it's different, it means the new changes occur, it will load that role. Uh, so that's why hash is very important in this case. The payload is the rest of the supportive attribute. In, in, in this case, it's payment ID, order ID, payment method, and amount. Okay, very straightforward. I think that's it. Everything is done about the go. So it's time for QA. Sorry, I have to. Um, Lazy, go with Slido right now. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. You want to be anonymous? Send me the question. Question, question, question. Yes. Uh, so, um, 
why the metaphor so uh, upset with the deep pregnancy. I, I think they invent a technique that just uh, has it to, to just uh, go around the difference uh, when the customer change the info. So yes. why so why they say invest so much uh, into the hasting? That's, hmm, that's a very broad question. Yeah. I don't I, I cannot stand for this that I must say that guy or take care of you like what he thinks. But um, in my own um, project, I work with um, a retail company who sell um, clothing, and they have audit every quarter, and the audit guy really cares about what changed in the last night. Yeah. So um, in this case, I think that about is a very good. It's it's suitable for them because if they he asked uh, when this this finance number go over budget something like that i can tell you exactly when and who did that based on aspects and for what based on the way we look at that yeah i'm not entirely sure if that is the case in vietnam i haven't worked with any company that uses made work in vietnam or have that special kind of requirement but audit is um it's a regular thing right? but I, I haven't seen the, the requirement like that in vietnam for the time being so thank you i have thought about that like how do you know um yes for data vote we don't i don't think that we can derive who make the chain on that but you will be on other cloud um or other sub treatment system so for example in my project i'm working with this back is dvd snowflake and um, when you ask so when DVD send the SQL script to Snowflake, so what they need to have the user as a user role and permission. And based on that, we can trace that who actually did that. Yeah, but like in production, it's not only one user, like production user. Mm, not entirely. Not entirely. Uh, if the if there's so that you're right about that. There's only one user, maybe one user, one warehouse, one role on production. But the trigger. But the trigger from DVD can come from the user ID. Oh, I mean, like, if you have a web application that generates a to the mm -hmm. database, mm -hmm. there's it's always only like one user because like the customer is right with your website by they never have credential, mm -hmm. and then it calls the on back an API and then the API, the API interact with the database and send some chance, and then that only one user. Yeah, exactly. I think that would be in uh, different applications for data system application. Right now, we're working on that. Um, the user will actually trigger the job and get the trace back. I mean, like, look at the, the system as a whole. You you are talking about like who make change within the data warehouse, but when the data came to the data warehouse, it's already too late because, like, for example, they order right. Mm -hmm. Then somebody cancel it. Yes, they cancel it in production system, and then that interaction interact with the DB somehow. One user, yeah, the server, the user, the yeah. API server. Yeah. So like, then it became like if you want to cut the story, you need to store the story. You need to store like who like did the action from the yeah. like, and like at some point you even need to um design your data structure in mm -hmm. the way that like maybe it depends on the user or somehow yeah. and like if all of that is solved at the application level mm -hmm. right if, if that's really the enterprise requirement then all of that will be solved at the application level it's not as like when you do data like yeah it, so it, like, it is almost it is very correct that will be solved at another level it is not in in um if you want to track on well, let's say it is user example in web application. We cannot track what user did, but right? we don't know which user do it, ex except if you have third application or somebody who logged into their account, stuff like that, right? But um, in this process, when we talk about who may change in the data warehouse as their lockers. Yeah, but like, what the value of doing that? Um, there's, I would say, there's a lot of cases where people try to. Uh, make change without approval and try to get personal data in, in our data warehouse and stuff like that. And we need to audit the trace out who did that. Yeah, different. That thing is probably more effective than sacrifice the bottom and out the whole thing, team by yeah. making the whole process more complicated. Yeah, pretty sure. That's correct. 
Thank you. All right, that's a very good question. Uh, Dr. Please answer it in some discussion. Uh, this is just for a, uh, a modeling perspective. So, should we um, include the uh, the business uh, kind of the uh, the business key for, uh, into or exclude it from the hash key? Because once the business I or once the business key changes, the uh, the hash key also changes. So that in, in that uh, in that case, the hash key seems a little bit redundant to me. So should we? From uh, kind of from the uh, from the uh, perspective of modeling, kind of the practice. So should we include it or exclude the the uh, the consistency out of the uh, the hash Wow, right. <laughs> we face that problem a lot in our project. I don't have an answer for that. Sadly, yes, there are some model we we include using key in them, and there are some model we don't. In a very special case where we think we change a lot. And and we have to actually model them as a separate entity to track their own change along the way, and also tracking their change in in, in other satellites. Um, I would say that in my experience, if the physical key doesn't change as much, you can include that in the hash table. We don't, so we have to make more value of checking all the actual changes. But um, if the physical key change quite a lot, then should exclude them and maybe even model them as a separate hub. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, don't take this effort. Internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, there's a lot of um, <laughs> self fighting experience. Right. I, uh, later on, it's very normal Yes. Yes. And uh, and I, I guess that uh, if we vary directly from the uh, later on layer, and we it will take a lot of time to run the variance. So how to how how we how we deal with that? Yeah, um, that is well. Um, if I take it correctly, um, if you want to do reporting, you will need from uh, reporting direct directly from the board. You need to do a lot of joints. Yes, in there to get data out. Right. So um, there is no universal way to do with that. If you actually depend on needs, right? If you only need um, for example, I need to know uh, how many customers are there in my database. Mm -hmm. That'd be very simple, simple, straightforward. Um, how many people first name is uh, Mo on Win? That'd be very simple because it's only one table. But it's more, uh, it's more of the um, the more complex requirement for reporting layers. You need to have a lot of joint in them. And I would recommend to actually build uh, information mark for um, dimensional modeling on all of it. You have too much data. Yeah, so what I understand is that you are suggesting to be another layer on top of the data on layers. Exactly. And then we follow any business use that we very directly from that, you know, yes. top layer. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Question, question, question. I don't have side open. Yeah. Uh, no, no, like not that one. All right. The single link now. Uh, that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm up for silence. Oh, well, the room is hot. Yeah, so we only move out. Sorry. So, <laughs> so okay. What's on the screen? Recent, recent. Scroll them down. Oh. They already answered, right? Yeah. As we've seen, and then we think, okay, that's one. That they have a hard for setup, SME to design, implementation, and maintenance. So, in what case, under the best practice of data board? Okay. So best practice for data world, again, if you're having um, enterprise requirement, um, you need auditability and historical data. Yours, you have multiple sources that change over time. You can add and, and remove a lot of stuff in your data warehouse. And um, well, the system is not more, and you should actually use data world. What the hell do the alternative way you have to 
I assume that your end goal is only to have uh, reporting, right? Reporting data. So, uh, uh, no, like you mentioned, like if you did, we need to have this story, you know, right? yeah. And then, like, did you consider like, what on the like, way that you can implement? They don't want one way, but you get another way. So, like, you have to implement in a compatible way. The like, yeah. can actually yes. over. So, Speaking, speaking about the historical topic, keep, keep, keeping history data, there are many ways to do that, even, even with data, with all the data modeling techniques. So usually, if I'm working, if I'm working on, on uh, the metro modeling, I would do a simple story, slowly changing dimension. So, um, we keep history based on um, yeah, each one of key and attribute valid from and put it to what time period. And that, if you then you change something, you can add them in. Um, they they have both methodology and with the DBT, with DBT help, they just automate that process and group them in the uh, satellite model. Behind that, you can actually use that logic on all the tables as well if you need to actually keep this right. So, and the SCD, you know, that's what you like to do now. Like, you do a, a whole thing that you can do a long time ago. Oh, right. When, so, when the storage was expensive, mm -hmm. the storage data is very cheap. Mm -hmm. You can just call it. You mean? You wake up everything every day. So, uh, every single day, you're loading new data with a new load data. Yes. Okay. That, that, would be, that, that, that would be a good thing also if you have enough uh, you know, storage. Well, you don't have to store data like in the yeah, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. They have like a requirement around how long you can store the data and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. And you can have a drop in the data as well. That is true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, I mentioned my project a lot in the past. Do not like it. But <laughs> yeah, in my project, I do have that. There are some data sources. They don't, um, it is more expensive to actually calculate cash data. And storing changes only uh, compared to the cost you need to pay for loading everything every day. So yes. yeah, if, if that if that's the case, then yes, I, I will go by loading everything every day with different timestamps, and we can be duplicate them later down on the reporting by that. Uh, for all the cases, if um, judging between pros and cons, if we need faster query time. I mean, more roles being trapped with slower query time, but after query time, when you check all the changes and um, the cost is not that much, I would go with cash diff and cash diff. Well, the other way you could look at it, like probably data warehousing and SQL analytics is not being cost like, right? So if you really yeah, want to, you, know. yeah. you need to think like streaming first. Mm -hmm. As streaming first, people don't know it's like. Initial, yeah. Yeah, streaming first people usually do, um, they will transform last. And like you get, you could have like the whole streaming system, like data flow, you for that, you mm -hmm. uh, and then the other system, I mean, you would for that. Yeah. Maybe just around the top. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say that it depends on the requirement. Maybe yeah, if I were you and I'm doing the whole streaming system, I will not do a lot of uh, transformation before load like this. It just load everything in and we do transformation data. For, um, for most of the cases I've seen, uh, uh, I don't think I've seen any other. Yes. <laughs> most of the cases I've seen and um, transformation first and we reduce the, the um, amount of work later on for the team. They're our client team. that will be better for them. So it always depends on your Thank you. Okay, question, 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 question. Everybody seems speaking already. In one year, we share my. Right? Right, sorry. I think I got slide off. Is that when. Is that a new one? When you add new record of, an hash, of a hash key in satellite, do you need insert up or update record? That hash key in hub? Um, interesting question. I would say we only insert the okay. So there's a new, the new, there's a new key coming in satellite. It should already be loaded in hubs already. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, point. No, let, let's let's go like this. The new customer coming in, the customer on my hash key. Okay. That hash key will get loaded into hub and stuff like that at the same time. Yeah. Uh, in satellite, there will a hash key of that customer, maybe percent Yeah. The next time that customer coming in, he um, get married to some family, change the name. The new hash key. Right. The hub they already have that hash key. This primary key, this customer ID mapping that exact customer with that ID, the hub will not get loaded. The satellite will get loaded with the um, same uh, hash key, but with a different hash key and different value from ready to change. So, means that the, the, uh, the original relationship between the uh, hub and satellite is still one to many. Yes. Yeah. So, but do we also update the, the kind of the load the load date time on the timestamp loading inside the hub once we have the new record of that uh, of the same hash key in satellite? That's a good question. I don't think we have the right now for available practice. We don't update the load date time the original hash key unless you do refresh the whole thing. Yeah, we don't. We want to keep the history when this the that key first appear in the table. Uh, that's a key. Yeah, but um, of course there'll be other cases when you need to see um, when that key got loaded the next time in the new change coming in. You can use you can use that in the satellite table with the new load date time. The new change coming in, the and that has to will be mapped. That role has to be mapped with a new load date time. You can check on that one. Yeah. Well, now I don't see. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen any requirement on you know having. <laughs> Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Is that uh, what do you think you can reuse some? Is it is it the old one? That's, that's okay. <laughs> so do I need to answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think you can reuse some schema function by applying. Uh, so I think that's the last one already. Right. Any other question? All right. I think I you used to use uh, dimensional number before. So, um, can you share um, a small uh, example on what key reasons that you decide to change from the dimensional model to the available map? Because I think that uh, each uh, type of model has the pros and cons. It's just you have to adapt with the to list the cons between that on the pros. It, yeah, it is true. Well, um, for the record, I just um, <laughs> I just reconfirm it a little bit. I didn't actually want to change the level. So um, we are doing um, for the open state. So data modeling should based on the customer requirement and the customer data system. So um, my customer data system right now is you know, more suitable for a, a hybrid of data both and dimensional modeling. That's why I'm using it right now. It doesn't mean that that um, it is, it's not one or another. I did not change completely. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the stuff I don't like about dimensional modeling is that uh, it's very hard to debug in dimensional modeling, especially in very wide back table. So um, uh, dimensional modeling, we're trying to Denormalize everything, right? We're going to see everything in just one single row, especially in fact table. Our client, they demand that they have a fact table that is uh, 50 columns long and <laughs> take one hour and a half to actually bury the whole, you know, um, 1,000 rows, I think, like that. And uh, it has a lot of joints and business keys and a lot of filtering in there. It's very hard for me to actually debug the whole thing. It would trace it down down to the level level. We split down into different components, smaller components, and we can actually trace it down way faster. But that, that's my only drawback with dimensional model. Yeah, follow up on that. Why is that? that why is that bad? Uh, yeah, I will not say that we intended to do so. Yeah, but I mean, like some of the I mean that part that would definitely be the case. Yes, about like by yes. what that means. Yes, uh, it is true. I'm not saying that's the best practice. Uh, well, I've been saying that to my uh, to our customer for a long time, but well, that's how they are using it, and they don't really want to change what IBA. So we have to do it different now. 
I agree with you that is not an actual correct way to do dimensional modeling. Not actually correct way, not the, the best way to do dimensional modeling. But we have to deal with that right now. So, so, oh yeah, like certain questions were like, so I also try a little bit of and I try to make a data and I have to ask myself, oh, if I need to make the case for like to do the data about the about like the other process that the people already have, like how do I use? Mm -hmm. So like uh, I don't think I have an answer for that yet. What what's the reason have? Yeah. Because data is not simpler, it's more complicated, right? And I don't yet see the benefit. There are some benefits you mentioned regarding like uh historical tracking um and like maybe easy to log and other stuff, but I feel like maybe that some of that problem should be solved at application level. Um and maybe like different tooling, like if the nature of the problem is driven, then like doing this on the you try to have to use something for what is not built for. Yeah. I think that would be the same answer that I would give in, in the previous question. That would always depend on your requirement for the system. So, uh, my requirement of system right now is a system that can handle this kind of stuff. And the is best suited for that. But if you already have something else to handle those in your, in your you know, system, you will have something to handle those. It will be better tooling and stuff like that on application level. Your customer doesn't care uh, where you handle it, it will be better on, on, on the application level. And well, it's good. I will not say that available is a must, uh, it's a must have for any enterprise. It is a good way to handle these things if you have an all in one solution or what we just go through. It doesn't mean that the solution could, should not be split into different smaller solutions in different layers. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I want to add more to this point. Is that first, I want to target the uh, your first question related to normalization and denormalization. There, there's always a reason behind the, uh, the decision to go with normalization or denormalization. And sometimes you, you might see that a fact table might contain maybe 50 columns long or maybe more. But the kind of the main benefits of doing the normalization inside a data warehouse is the third. The, and I think the, the first, uh, the very important part is about performance. So once uh, when one wants to move your, your table into the BI layer or to the reports layer, once once a user starts to operate or maybe do more stuff with the table, working on one single, one single physical table is always faster. Then you go in, then, then you have to work with a group of tables that require the loss of joining even on the dimensional modeling. So for example, if you want maybe on a maybe on, on, on a sales table, on, on an order table, I want to know more all of the information of the, the, the product inside that order, maybe the product name, the uh, the category, uh the kind of the uh the, the vertical line or, or, or something related. So I just do the filtering right on that physical table. So that's why you see, you may normally see that a kind of, we all we always have some kind of fact tables that already be normalized and the information inside is already duplicated with uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, normalized dimension that they uh, normalized dimension. And as, as you said before, because the storage now is cheap. So we now have the ability to have the information duplicated on both sides on the dimension on the fact tables as well. So once you want to do all of the filtering, which is the most things that maybe the normal users, they, they, they normally operate on their BI layer on Tableau, Luca, Foxport, something like that. So that, that, that's the first reason why we might see the normal the normalized table right in IEA and our I dimension of all of it. That's the first stuff. The second stuff is about the complexity of the data vaults. I, I totally agree with you that uh, data vaults is not something simpler. It's much complex, it is it's much complex and more complicated. But the thing of uh, data vaults is that it, it provides another layer between your warehouse, your dimensional modeling, and your your raw or your staging layer, it provides an, it, it provides another layer for you for you to add, and as Ben said before, it's, it is more easier for you to debug. So, for example, um, it is one of the uh, the uh, the currently consideration that we are taking right now in our projects 
that we are working for a client that they are having a, a user they mentioned inside there inside the SQL Server. But in the future, they, they are they, they're saying that they are considering to loading more of their Salesforce user and their, their users from another system to the same data warehouse as well. But the thing is that they, they, they're not sure about that yet. They, um, they haven't taken any decision about that yet. And we are still in the phase that we are investigating the data from, the, from those external systems. So once we, once we have those data, we want what, because during the time that we are developing the uh, kind of the user dimension for the SQL Server, their backend system, we also need to be ready for so that our, our dimension will be able to scale with with the with the new source system with the upcoming system of the same entity users coming into our data warehouse, and and whereas we are ready to build unify all of those systems into one single dimension, one single user dimension, we will be able to keep track of all the uh, the mapping and also the attribute inside that dimension with the data we already have. We, we, we already have from, from the data vault layer without going to the code or without going to the state, all the way into the staging layer, which is technical, which is maybe denormalized, which is very kind of so many redundant data in, in, in inside the raw or inside the raw or the staging layer right there. So the, the data vault is providing us another layer to debug the, the difference between the, uh, the, the, the between the dimensional modeling and, and also the staging layer. But it all only work and only work if you have like as I said, if you have a kind of a complex source system in hand, you have so many uh, source system to indicate one single entity. That's where that's where data vaults will work and we shy. Otherwise, if you want to with some kind of like, uh, uh, small systems, you don't have to integrate so many uh, uh, external sources into that. Then when, when you try to integrate data vault into your user chip, it will get things much more complicated. Um, one thing that I do is uh, okay. to ask other people about it that they give me. Because like many of them, the constraint are artificially constructed, and then it's not really a constraint. For example, for your fifty column constraint, it's high with them. Um, and then maybe other approach. And when when I not have to do that, what it sound like? Like you have too many constraints, and it sound wrong. Like the thing that we do as building data warehouse is that we man we manipulate data schema, right? That's what we do. Sure. We we will like change in the format of schema to whatever that suits our purpose, whatever that like able to uh reform the data people want, right? So I don't see like any limitation in terms of like how we can structure our data. Right. And then like even if they already have their accident data pipeline that's working, okay, or fine with that. I will import it into myself, my like the schema that I like, format it the way that I like, report in the way that they want. And okay. then that will work, right? I guess like maybe some of the constraint you have is not really a constraint. Yeah. Maybe you need to speak to some people higher up. Like do you want really want to solve that problem? Yeah. Why is he there? Yeah, believe me, I understand. Yeah, there are. Um, well, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of reason why we cannot do that yet, but I understand. It's a it's, it's good way to do so. If you're constrained, there should be a way to solve it. But uh, doesn't mean that we don't want to solve it. It, it just means that um, that constraint is a little bit big that we solve right now. So, okay. Thank you. Next question, probably the last one, because everybody, somebody already, everybody's sleeping. I just know all the questions. Yeah. Yeah, okay, no other questions. And then, thank you, guys. Yeah.